Um, okay, so um, this is uh, going to be uh, a talk that I actually uh, gave last year. Uh, there is a bit of update, uh, but I think it's uh, it's quite interesting and important. Um, that's worth um, going over again. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've uh, been contributing to LibreOffice for uh, around six years now. Uh, the last five years have been focused on online. Um, and I, I really enjoy um, hacking away and adding features and, and fixing bugs. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's me. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through uh, the sidebar and talk about the, uh, a little bit about the challenges and the implementation of how we went about um, trying to bring it to the browser, um, which actually turned out to be not as straightforward as one would have liked. Uh, I don't tend to read my slides. So if, if you try to uh, read the bullet points while you hear me speak, I think it, you're gonna benefit um, the most. And at the end, I will leave a few minutes uh, for questions. So what is the sidebar? Just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, if we look at the desktop um, uh, window of LibreOffice, we we're gonna immediately see that uh, we have the, the, the sidebar um, hidden that we can um, pop up uh, to edit the properties of whatever context that we're in. And um, here I'm showing the Clubra Office um, um, build, and you can see for the different uh, document types, you have a slightly different properties and slightly different set of um, options and, and um, settings that we can um, um, tune. So what we really would love to have is the same kind of power and flexibility uh, in the browser. Uh, and that is, uh, it's much more difficult to bring all these settings um, without really doing the, um, the, the core implementation of all of that all over again. So the idea here is to find an easier way to make sure that all of this is available without necessarily um, you know, rebuilding it from scratch. Um, here I'm showing the latest screenshots from, um, from the browser side. And you can, uh, you can see that it immediately looks very, very similar to the desktop. Um, the right two uh, screenshots, they have scroll bars. That's because the uh, sidebar is actually longer than the actual browser uh, window size. Um, and that works seamlessly in the browser without any um, performance delays or um, flicker, as, as we're going to talk a little bit more about the challenges for, for doing that. On the left, I want to um, bring your attention to the pop-up um, color um, um, swatch um, uh, pop-up window. Uh, and again, that is all done in HTML, and it's, um, um, it, it works seamlessly as well. So um, before I move on, I really should take a moment to um, thank our uh, partners. Um, we can't do most of the uh, main features um, that um, we would love to implement and the bug fixes without their support and uh, without their financing. Um, so this is a, a big thank you uh, to all of our partners who help. Um, so the sidebar, um, how hard can it be to bring it to the browser? Um, I mean, after all, it's just a window and it be fairly straightforward to make sure that um, that is working just as, as um, the other um, windows and dialogues. Um, so that's the first intuition that this, the sidebar is a type of dialogue, um, but immediately we see that it's actually a special kind of dialogue. It's a, it's a kind of dialogue that um, isn't floating um, unless we make it. Um, so it can actually be um, uh, docked on one part of the screen, or it can be its own window. Um, and we can close it and open, but it doesn't lose its, um, its state. Indeed, its state is dependent on um, the context. So if I'm editing text, then the sidebar is showing properties of text and paragraphs and, and characters. Um, but if it's, a, if it's an image or it's a graphic shape, then 
you know, it's the properties that, um, that I would expect to see um, for images and, and um, you know, graphic objects. Um, similarly, it, it's, um, um, uh, it's flexible in that it has collapsing panes in it. Um, and um, I can control its size um, dynamically, and I expect its content to um, also become very flexible. So all of these things make it um, different from just a, a regular dialogue. Um, so if we take the idea of um, pretending that the sidebar is just a dialogue and we build on top of the dialogue tunneling that we already have, um, then that is obviously, you know, it brings us closer to realizing um, the goal of having a sidebar working in the browser. So let's quickly look at how the dialog tunneling works so we can understand how we can get the sidebar to work. Um, the dialog tunneling idea is basically um, to render any individual dialog that, that we have in core um, as an image and separately handle all of its messages uh, that are uh, being handled in core to be sent back to the browser so that the browser would know, for example, that a dialogue has been created and would give the dialogue a unique ID so that whenever we're, um, we have any event uh, that happens on the dialogue, like resizing or uh, indeed even just uh, updating the uh, refreshing the UI, then we would be able to uniquely uh, uh, identify it uh, and uh, make sure that all the inputs as well are sent correctly to the correct um, uh, to the correct dialog. So um, to do that, we have a list of messages and message types, and we have uh, the IDs to use for uh, communicating all of these messages, including the resizing message, the creation and destruction, and uh, rendering, which is the window paint. So with all these uh, machinery, we, we can um, communicate with the browser and let the JavaScript, the browser track the visible dialogues and um, update its UI accordingly. So we built on top of this infrastructure and we've added uh, a new kind of um, window, uh, again, because the sidebar is a special and a different kind of dialogue, we had to make sure that the, that the browser code um, can identify the sidebar as a special um, dialog and not just a generic one. Um, primarily because a generic dialog has certain features that the sidebar does not, including um, you know, closing it when, whenever you want, um, the size and, and um, other attributes that we've already mentioned. So uh, when, when we've added, uh, special handling for, for the, um, the, the sidebar, we also made sure that um, the, uh, the JavaScript is able to um, have its own input, as in when should the sidebar be visible is no longer a, uh, something that is controlled um, by, the, um, by the core or the back end, but the user is also able to uh, show it or hide it at will. Um, and indeed, uh, very recently, we've also um, been adding support for uh, remembering the user's preference so that when you uh, load a document um, of the same type, um, if you've had the sidebar uh, hidden, um, then it would remain hidden by default unless you make it visible again and vice versa. So all of these um, special you know, um, cases um, were important to make the sidebar behave um, as we expect it to. Um, so uh, a little bit about the, the relationship between the code and the visuals. Um, um, and I don't expect most people to be familiar with this, but it, it's important uh, for the remaining of the talk to make sure we're, um, we have a, a mental image of things. Um, the sidebar itself has, it's a multi-layered um, uh, component. It, on, the, on the very um, top level, we have the sidebar docking window, which is responsible for docking and undocking um, the whole sidebar. In this case, you can see I have it floating. Um, so it, it is as, as if it's a, it's a dialogue, except it's a resizable dialogue. Um, the sidebar also has embedded in it the tab bar. This is hidden 
in, in online. So on the browser, we don't have a need for it. And instead we have all of the, um, the top, top bar uh, buttons as part of the toolbar itself on the top um, or indeed the menu. Um, within the, the sidebar itself, we have panels and you can see the panels here. Um, they have um, 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 a, um, um, a hat um, icon next to them, which means that they're collapsible. So here the style character and paragraph would be um, um, panels, um, but the panels um, themselves are um, within um, decks and the decks are the different uh, sidebar views that you can have from the tab bar. So you, the properties would be one deck um, and you know you would have the styles or the gallery and, and, and so on. Um, again, one of the oddities of, of working with um, the sidebar is that it has uh, some counterintuitive uh, features like uh, the fact that the sidebar child window is in fact the parent of the docking window. This is an unfortunate consequence of the usage of the word, the word child in, in the you know, hierarchy of, um, um, of objects in clothing. So um, you know, sometimes some things can be quite counterintuitive, but um, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's life. So um, when, when we are trying to tunnel any um, dialogue in general, um, you uh, essentially are trying to represent the the top level dialogue as your you know, main um, uh, component that you're trying to tunnel. Um, whenever the top level um, dialogue is being resized or rendered, um, you want to convey all of these messages to the browser, and expect everything to work just fine. But as we've seen, um, the sidebar is a, is a multi-layered um, component and it's not obvious. Um, what you want to, which level you want to um, tunnel. Um, so the most obvious level would be the deck because the deck is the one that has all the panels and that's the main body of the sidebar. You don't really care about the tab, tab bar on the side or indeed any of the other um, borders. Um, but that unfortunately didn't pan out and I won't go into the details. There are multiple problems there and the main one is that the decks are interchangeable and you do want to uh, uh, show the deck that is visible. So uh, tunneling each deck separately doesn't make much sense. So we tunnel the sidebar docking window instead, and that seems to be working just perfectly. Um, so the, um, the logic to um, having the, the, the sidebar uh, implementation is to have a special casing for the sidebar docking window. Um, what we do is we handle the creation um, logic uh, within the, uh, the resize notification. Um, again, that's a technical detail. And the, the reason for that is because at the time of creating the sidebar, we don't have specific dimensions to it. Um, and it doesn't make much sense to tell the browser to create a, um, a window that doesn't have dimensions yet. So there are a little bit of oddities like that in the implementation. Um, we also need to make sure that um, the sidebar is being loaded from the browser, then we need to hide the tab bar and we need to account for the dimensions of the tab bar that we've um, hidden. Um, and we need to make sure that scrolling um, uh, uh, works fine. I'm gonna get back to the problem of uh, uh, the difficulty of scrolling um, uh, the sidebar uh, in a second. Um, so, Another challenge is that um, we're not just uh, tunneling the sidebar itself, but we also want to tunnel any pop-up windows that it contains. And, and the most obvious one is, is the, uh, the color um, uh, swatch. And that is um, not the only one, but you also have drop-down menus and you have other um, buttons that interact uh, on multiple levels. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that um, these child windows are cr created within the scope of the parent um, sidebar. But at the same time, there has to be some ownership relationship because if the user um, closes the sidebar, you would expect that the pop-ups would also disappear. Again, remember that all of this is happening in the um, HTML world um, and over there, 
the relationships um, ha have to be preserved uh, for things to work correctly. Um, if you create independent HTML um, um, elements, uh, they respect the parent-child relationship when you um, close the parent or dismiss the parent. So there, there are you know minor details like that to be um, mindful of. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the challenges that, that we had in, in a little bit more um, detail um, because they're uh, fairly instructive and it helps to understand you know the kind of effort that goes into building out even small features like um, you know bringing the sidebar. Uh, to the browser. So um, some of the, the, the unexpected things um, that we've had is that, as I said, um, creation is not necessarily the point where you want to um, make sure uh, that you uh, pass the, the creation messages to the um, uh, browser, but you want to make sure that you uh, notify that you've created a window when you have everything necessary to realize the creation. Um, that includes the dimensions and so on. Um, another thing is that uh, you want to make sure that when you're creating a window or indeed whenever in the background that window is interacting with the document, that it doesn't uh, interfere with the user's um, interaction on the browser. Um, again, this might not be obvious, but when uh, the user changes the context, the desktop, it might be reasonable for the input focus to move to the uh, uh, to the sidebar or indeed sidebar updates its, um, its inputs. Um, but those events trickle back to the browser and the browser cannot differentiate um, between um, a focus move that was initiated by the user, meaning the user is clicking inside the sidebar to end um, or click a button or, or do something. Um, and the sidebar just updating itself um, as a result of the user, you know, maybe typing in the document, right? So these things can get a little bit, um, um, you know, muddled and, and unclear. And we need to make sure that the user experience is, uh, is as smooth, as, as uh, natural as possible. Um, so we have to keep track of um, really what's, what's happening and make sure that the, the sidebar does not adversely affect the user's um, experience and interaction uh, with, with the document. Um, minor things um, like the difference between the different do document sidebars, again, can, can play a big role. Um, historically, Impress had a slightly different workflow than Writer and Calc, um, and those were uh, surprising indeed because we've, we've discovered that there were certain um, rough edges in Impress that um, Writer and Calc did not suffer. Um, on a more detailed uh, level, um, the, uh, the, the relationship between the internal um, structure of the docking window, which is the UI, and how it interacts with the view shell and how it interacts with essentially the, the, the document updates um, is um, different, I said, between Impress and, and um, Calc and, and, and Writer. Um, and we had to account for that. We had to make sure that um, the, um, the relationship uh, is uh, preserved, even though in Impress, um, we do have multiple views and we need to make sure that the, the, correct, um, the, the correct view owns the, uh, the sidebar. Um, and you would imagine why that is. It's because every slide um, um, comes with, it, with its own logic and uh, that affects the sidebar, whereas in Writer and in Calc, um, you don't have um, uh, that distinction, really. Um, so, you know, minor things like that can become um, a really big uh, uh, time drain and resource drain to figure out what's the best way of, of um, solving the problem without um, having a lot of, um, you know, temporary or workaround um, fixes. Um, so let's um, talk a little bit about the um, scroll because I think that is um, uh, quite an interesting uh, problem or oddity of the, of the sidebar. So if you go back to the sidebar on, on the desktop, you will remember that the sidebar, if it is docked, it has the height of the available space um, um, in, in your uh, vertical um, dimension on the screen. So if, if your screen is, is a little bit you know, shorter um, in height, um, the sidebar is going to be shorter as well 
but that is fine because the contents can be scrolled. Um, if you uh, undock the sidebar and make it floating, then you can decide how high or how wide uh, you want the sidebar to be. And in that case, it behaves just like any, any other dialog, except that it would still scroll its contents if you um, overflow. Um, all of this is really fine, except in the browser, we do not want to um, have a scroll bar. Um, and if you click on the scroll bar, we have to render um, the complete sidebar over again. You can imagine, I mean, you can do that for um, just one uh, uh, click that would, you know, get back to you uh, within a matter of, uh, you know, some milliseconds. But if you try to continuously scroll, it just would not scale, right? It would be very uh, slow and it would potentially flicker or cause other, um, you know, visual disturbances. So what we really want is we don't want any scrolling to happen um, in the sidebar itself. We want the sidebar to be as large as it needs to be to contain all of its um, panes and panels internally. Um, and we want to render it as one big image. And then that big image can uh, get uh, embedded in the browser. And if it is larger than the available space, then the browser can allow us to scroll the image, right? And scrolling an image in the browser is uh, as fast as it can possibly be, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's the intuition or that's the basic idea, except um, there are uh, some panels that are greedy, meaning um, the more space they have, the more space they can consume. It's just because they take up whatever space is necessary and they divide it amongst its elements. Um, and so you can't have a, a, you can't ask the sidebar, what's your optimum height? That there is no optimum height. There is a minimum height potentially, but there is no maximum height in some cases. So again, you're, you're you know, back at, at the point where um, you don't have a clear answer, but what you need to do is you need to come up with some uh, engineering compromises where you um, try to avoid the worst case which is you're cramming all of your sidebar elements in a small space, or you have a very large sidebar um, that just looks, um, uh, you know, unfriendly um, to the user. Um, so finding a middle ground was uh, was one of the challenges, and making sure that the the scroll bar, the vertical scroll bar, um, doesn't show up in the sidebar itself. Um, was the, the, the main challenge, and, and that remained actually uh, a minor problem uh, for some time. Um, here you can see, for example, that we were um, able to read the sidebar internally um, to some acceptable um, height, um, but still, unfortunately, we have the scroll bar show up um, that actually scrolls one pixel. Um, that, that's because there is nothing more to show, um, but because of you know, the math and how it works, um, it still thinks that it needs a sidebar to do some scrolling. So, you know, getting rid um, of, of that annoying sidebar that's completely useless uh, was, was, it was important. So we did fix it um, and we were able to do it. So as I said, um, um, this is um, um, a talk that I gave last year. Um, and uh, within the past year, there have been uh, quite a number of improvements and um, advances. Um, so it's it's not completely the case that uh, you know there isn't anything new to say about the, the sidebar. Um, the the uh, the biggest change um, was that we've made sure that the the sidebar works not just on the desktop but also um, in mobile, um, and it, it works across uh, multiple devices. Um, and it worked uh, in a very uh, seamless way so that the experience is, is really good. But obviously we've been able to uh, fix a number of um, um, corner cases, bugs, um, really made sure that the user experience uh, was as best as it can be um, with a smooth um, refreshing um, and um, making sure that it does not interfere with the user's uh, input or interaction with the document. Um, so. That has been the, the, the general um, uh, progress. As I said, we've got rid of the double um, scroll bar. We, we no longer have that annoying internal scroll bar. Um, and um, for the mobile part, um, I encourage uh, everyone who's interested to see 
they're reusing the sidebar on phones um, uh, by Shimon, um, uh, which is uh, on, the, on the last day, on, on Saturday at 12.25 uh, um, um, p.m. Um, and um, with that, um, I want to thank you. Um, and I am happy to answer any question, questions or comments that you might have. If there is anybody who is still around and can hear me, assuming I haven't been talking to myself for half an hour. I can hear you. Don't worry. <laughs> that's, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> you can be. There are some questions in the uh, chat. Oh, please. Um, Maybe uh, let me start with a question to you. Uh, so you can read uh, in parallel the, the, the message in the, in the chat. Uh, one is, um, we have made some effort to make the sidebar accessible uh, by using a function key which, which steps through the uh, various UIs in the sidebar and then between the controls and panels and so on. Uh, have you considered um, accessibility? Um, yes, the, 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 there are some serious challenges there, but it is um, doable. Um, the main challenge is that um, the relationship between the different elements um, in uh, the browser um, and the actual UI um, components um, in, in the in core um, is not one-to-one. -one. As I said, for the, for the sidebar on the desktop, the sidebar is rendered as an, as an image. It's, a, it's really a single solid image. Um, and that is visible as a single you know, HTML image node in the browser. Um, of course, on the desktop proper, um, you have all the different, you know, combo boxes, edit boxes and buttons as individual elements and you can tap through them and you can get accessibility on that level. So to be able to have, you know, um, accessibility on the individual UI elements uh, for the sidebar, at least, you would need to have, um, something much, much more uh, native to the browser. So for example, we've been talking about the possibility of um, porting the sidebar to be, to be native um, uh, HTML components. Um, and you know, one idea is to um, tunnel the UI as an XML, and then we convert that XML into HTML elements and every element would interact and would render individually. Um, with the user. Um, once we have something like that, I think it would become much easier and more uh, realistic um, to have accessibility on, on yeah. that level. Yeah. I would only add to that, like it is not uh, actually that far because like we are doing the default notebook bar uh, via JSON, not, not XML in this case, but, uh, but the idea is that hopefully like we will get that for the sidebar as well at some stage. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, can I also add something? You said, hello, this is Tour. You said native HTML, but if one considers the the iOS and Android apps, and the same thing is also used there, uh, then there is really nothing native as such about HTML, but what would be native would, of course, be the, the real platform controls, but that's a completely different thing. Yes, indeed, but that is, that's, a, that's a really important point. Um, and that is that, that we do support, you know, multiple um, devices and platforms. And, and we, we have to be very mindful that whatever solution we, we come up with, um, you know, doesn't require a lot of special casing. And, um, you know, to, to Candy's point, there has been a lot of progress on um, the mobile side um, with JSON. And, you know, we can leverage that same, um, you know, technology and approach in, in other places as well. Um, but as, as one would imagine, you know, the, the way um, um, complex things like this progress is when we have interest and we have funding um, so that we can implement it on uh, one platform and then leverage that in other places. Um, and uh, that, you know, doesn't necessarily always happen in a coordinated fashion. Um, but, you know, slowly we're, we're uh, really improving things as, as one can see. 
Um, I have another question if, if we have um, time. Um, drop down menus are really slow if they are very long, uh, like font selection. Um, is there something planned to improve it? Um, example for font selection, um, it uh, should not all installed the drop down. Um, okay, so um, the fonts is a special case. Uh, and it's a special case for two reasons. One is that it, um, it, it doesn't have an upper limit. Uh, the size of the combo box or drop down is really as large as the number of fonts that are installed on the system. Um, and that, that makes it you know, really you know, at least linear in the number of fonts that you have. So it's unlike the other ones that like the font size, for example, which you know how many elements you have and every time you're rendering the same thing. Um, that's one challenge. The other challenge is that there is a complex font caching in the background that we need to query um, and we need to, um, there is a bit of code that needs to execute. That happens on the desktop as well. Um, but remember, all of that is, is really um, rendered on demand on the browser. Um, so I agree with you. It is, um, uh, you know, it, it is slower than it, it needs to be, um, but there aren't obvious ways of making that uh, faster, especially on a system that has thousands of fonts, for example. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to, uh, you know, ideas and, and suggestions um, on how to um, tune that. But um, as I said, these are the challenges. These are the realities of um, uh, the font menu. Any other questions? if we have time. Uh, thank you, Heiko. These virtual conferences lack the interaction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but I think this is a good time to um, end the talk. Um, thanks everyone for your attention. Um, and if you have any questions or ideas or suggestions, I'm, I'm happy to take them offline. IRC or um, uh, indeed by email. Thank you so much.